Well, I'm Greg Harlick. I'm a neurosurgeon in Winnipeg, Canada, and I'm also medical director of the Brain Trauma Foundation and very disappointed I'm not there with you in person. Uh, I would say that international travel is very onerous right now still for us in Canada, so uh, sorry I'm not there. Uh, I will say that I'm a big fan of pupillometry, uh, but no one is paying me to say that, and that's very important in a talk like this. Um, whenever I talk about neurocritical care technologies these days, um, what I always tell people, I like to be a little provocative, make sure you're doing the basics well first. Um, we don't want these advanced neuromonitoring technologies to substitute for good care, we want them to, to augment good care. So this is worthy of a separate talk, but these are a lot of things that I commonly see done improperly um, in, in a lot of sick neuro patients uh, and people that, that are trying to perfuse their brains with a Cushing response. Uh, you know, people will, will sometimes bring down their blood pressure when they shouldn't. Uh, I still see a lot of ICP treated prophylactically. And the problem when you do that is the brain makes its own osmoles because it doesn't like to be shrunk. And then when you really need to treat, uh, you, you can't as effectively. Um, still see a lot of people that want to sample CSF and, and monitor sur for surveillance when the reality is that that actually seems to, to increase the risk of infection. Uh, similarly, antibiotic prophylaxis for EVDs uh, doesn't reduce the risk of infection, uh, but, but probably uh, increases infection with resistant organisms. Despite the fact that it's the only thing we have level one evidence not to do, I still see a lot of people um, uh, that are giving steroids. So I wanted to start with a case, and uh, my perspectives on pupillometry have really evolved over time. Uh, so uh, this is the case um, uh, of a patient I managed very early in my, my career when I first started at the University of Utah. So the, the patient's scan looked a lot like this. It was an acute subdural hematoma. The patient came in with a lot of uh, uh, midline shift initially. And uh, what was fairly remarkable to me was that the patient's ICP uh, stayed low. and um, uh, was not a problem, um, even when it probably should have been. Sure enough, on day four, uh, the patient blew a pupil. And uh, this was really bothersome. Why did this patient blow a pupil with no ICP elevation? And um, we, we did a, a bit of a, a look into this. And what we found was that um, we need to remember all of these IC, um, ICU technologies have weaknesses. And what had happened was that our, our parenchymal ICP monitor had actually pulled out. It was no longer inside the cranium. Um, and uh, of course, you know, then we, we weren't actually detecting the high ICP. So we really should have been attentive to the fact that this patient should have had high ICP. Uh, probably we should have been doing provocative maneuvers once a shift to, to make sure that our monitor was actually functioning properly. Um, I think if we had looked more closely at the post-placement CT, we would have caught this problem. But I think the other thing that really would have caught it would have been pupillometry. And uh, I think it's actually one of the reasons that we, we invested in this technology. Uh, what I would say is that um, when, when I really was first introduced to pupillometry on my fellowship at, at San Francisco General Hospital, I, I wasn't very keen on the technology. Uh, at this point, I was a, a bit of an arrogant neurosurgeon. I said, you know what, I'm a professional pupillometer, <laughs> uh, a pupil technician. Uh, I, I assess pupils well. I do it all the time. I'm good at this. Um, and it took me about six months in San Francisco to, to really see the benefits of pupillometry. And, and I saw that, you know, one of my mentors, Jeff Manley, made a lot of treatment decisions based on, um, uh, on, on pupillometry values. So uh, I, I've, I'm a, a converted person at this point. I, I really value uh, pupillometry. Okay, so um, we, we rapidly became, when I was at the University of Utah, that the first, or actually I think that the second uh, ICU in all of America to have a, a pupillometer for every bed. And I think there's a lot of obvious advantages to this technology. So it's very accurate to one one hundredth of a millimeter. Um, and uh, my, my mentor, Ross Bullock, had published one of the early papers on this, suggesting that it would provide a lot of advanced uh, warning before a herniation event. Um, so here, here's that paper, 15.9 uh, hours uh, early warning before an, a, a herniation, uh, also demonstrated an association between uh, these NPI values uh, or the normalized pupillary index and, and ICP. And, and uh, that, that has carried a lot of weight with me because uh, uh, Ross Bullock is a, is a trusted mentor and colleague. 
Uh, I think if you look at the literature, we're actually very bad, uh, even even us arrogant neurosurgeons at, at assessing pupils. And that's especially true uh, when the pupils are small. Um, there's actually an error rate of about 40%. So I think we need to be attentive to that. And, um, you know, here, here's a lot of the reasons that I, I like pupilometry. So it's a very objective measure. It's highly accurate. It's highly sensitive. Again, I don't know any human that can measure a pupilometer to one one hundredth of a millimeter. Um, you know, I people say, well, but it, it doesn't correlate perfectly with the ICP. And I say, well, I don't care. I want to I want a better pupil exam. Uh, I think an ability uh, to, to to monitor the third nerve function uh, independent of ICP is very important. Uh, I think it's not hard to convince anyone that it's, it's very helpful when a patient has a dark iris. Um, and I'll say that in, in Utah, we stopped seeing pupils blow. Uh, we started to catch pupils as they were starting to become unreactive. And uh, I think there's a, a period of over a year uh, after we introduced these where we just didn't see pupils blow. And I, I hope that that led to less uh, damage to the brainstem. Um, you know, very helpful in, in a meiotic pupil. Again, that, that very high error rate in this context. And I, I think we need to be very mindful of Larry Marshall's lesson um, back, you know, this classic paper from, from uh, about 30 years ago, uh, where Larry Marshall taught us that, that people can herniate without an ICP increase. And that's especially true when we're dealing with temporal lobe pathology. And I, I think that, that uh, a pupilometer is really priority monitoring in this circumstance. Um, we had a brand new nurse, uh, resource nurse that was covering in our in our neuro ICU in, in Utah, and uh, she had very little neuro experience, but knew that if the, the MPI value on the pupillometer dropped below three, she was supposed to tell someone. Sure enough, it happened. Uh, she caught a, a pupil early in the process of blowing, and we were able to intervene and, and save that patient. Um, I also think it's very useful technology in, in um, uh, sedated, paralyzed patients. Um, in most cases, they preserve pupil reactivity. So especially if you don't have an ISP monitor in place, it's very helpful. And um, I will say that um, I once saw a faculty member inappropriately declare a patient brain dead. And that is a really big deal. That can be instant loss of hospital privileges. So uh, I think pupillometry is especially helpful in a declaration of brain death. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, conversely, if you have a patient with poor pupil reactivity that's, that's um, uh, improving uh, slightly, that, that also could be very helpful in, in some of these very sick patients. People say, well, Greg, when do you use the pupillometer? I say, well, I, I use it whenever I would normally check a pupil uh, and whatever patient I would typically check a pupil. So there's nothing magic about this. And what do you do if the MPI trends down? Well, I do the same thing as, as if a GCS drops. So this is a patient where, you know, I'm going to, to, to look at, uh, at the lab values. I'm going to consider repeat imaging and, and potentially treating these patients. Um, I think one of the key uh, ideas here, though, is that it really matters how you use this technology. So here's a patient that was treated at a, a major American institution uh, where this patient didn't derive any benefit from the pupillometer. So you can see that beginning very early in the morning, the NPI values were starting to trend down. Um, and by about 3 p.m., uh, the pupil actually blew. And um, probably this is a patient where there should have been some sort of intervention in the morning. Um, but there was no action on the, the, the pupillometer value. So it's not just enough to, to, to buy these technologies. Um, and in terms of pragmatic uses, I did want to share a quick little anecdote. So uh, we were very uh, privileged to, to host a, a number of uh, uh, neurotrauma masters in, in Utah a couple of years ago, uh, including Sir Graham Teasdale, of course, the inventor of the Glasgow Coma Scale. And uh, he had never seen uh, a pupillometer before. So uh, he insisted that I, I test it on him. Uh, unfortunately, the thing just didn't didn't work. Uh, it seemed to malfunction for the first time. And wouldn't you know it, that, that you know, uh, the, the, the god of neurosurgery and, and, and the people out of malfunctions. Um, and I insisted that we repeat it again. He grabbed my hand. He says, Greg, 80s pupil. <laughs> so I don't know how many medical students he's tricked over the years, but pupilometers are also good at detecting 80s pupils and people that invented the Glasgow Coma Scale. So, um, and I'm going to close with with a, a final case. So uh, again, I've, I've moved uh, back home to to Winnipeg, Canada, and uh, I'm back in a position again of, of beginning to acquire these technologies. Um, so uh, 
we're, we're on the verge of starting a, a pupillometry program here. And I, I recently had a patient that I think really would have benefited from this technology. So this is a patient uh, who had a fall. He was on uh, dual antiplatelets. Uh, we, we ended up performing a decompressive craniectomy. And um, several days into his ICU stay, he developed this extraction of fluid collection, uh, whether we call it external hydrocephalus or a hygroma. And quite unfortunately, um, this actually led to a herniation event as, as this collection grew. Uh, this was not detected by the ICP monitor that, that was in place and functioning properly. Uh, unfortunately, this patient blew a pupil. Um, and uh, as we're uh, sorting out with a family how to handle this, uh, this actually happened several times that the patient never actually regained uh, his baseline uh, neurological status and ultimately care was withdrawn. So uh, I'll say as someone that, that had pupillometers and, and now doesn't, um, you know, this is technology that uh, I, I really wish I had again and, and, and hope to again very soon. So with that, I will close and uh, we'll, we'll pass things over to Dr. Bernard.